Welcome to the WHO European region. My name is Petra Hongel. My name is Ramis Roar. My name is Olga Alenik. The, the European region covers 53 countries from as far north as Norway and the Russian Federation. To Israel and Malta in the warm south. From Iceland and Greenland in the west. And Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan in the east. The WHO European region is rich in its diversity of culture, language, history, but first and foremost, its people. Welcome to WHO Europe. Stay with us over the next hour as we explore different stories from people of our region. Also coming up is an exercise session. We have a five minute cooking class for kids by kids. Take a few minutes with us for a meditation session with an expert in Moscow. Plus, we'll find out from children what they really think about hand washing and the coronavirus. And we will find out from teens what they think about the importance of health in their schools. All of this and more during the next 60 minutes. But first, Dr. Hans Kluge officially became the WHO Regional Director for Europe 100 days ago. Throughout his career, beginning as a family doctor in Belgium, along a journey to Somalia, Liberia, prisons in Siberia, the former Soviet Union countries, Myanmar, and the People's Democratic Republic of Korea, and most recently leading the division of health systems and public health of WHO Europe for a decade, Hans Kluge has always been committed for, better, for achieving better health for all, especially with a focus on the vulnerable. Petra speaks with Hans about Walk the Talk, what it means for WHO Europe and himself personally. So, a bit of fresh air is always good for your health. What does Walk the Talk mean for WHO Europe? Walk the Talk in these tough times means leaving no one behind. We have to act in solidarity and with empathy, particularly for the vulnerable, like the elderly. I would say, now more than ever, it's time to take care of our health, but according to the WHO definition, physical, mental and social well-being. Only through united action for better health, we will get out of the situation into a better world. And what does Walk the Talk mean for you personally? For me, it means, towards the member states, to keep my campaign commitments, to do everything possible for the WHO Regional Office for Europe to be a true center of excellence relevant to the real issues faced by the member states. For the staff, for me, it means to act according to the WHO Value Charter, treat everyone with respect and dignity. And to my family, it means that despite of all the work we do now, I still find the time for them. 2020 is the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. Nurses and midwives make up the vast majority of health workers, and they do really important work. In 2017, Lauren Marie Gregg was a student at the University of Malta in her last year of studies to become a midwife. In this video, Lauren shares her experience and her dreams for the future. I'm Lauren, um, I study midwifery. I'm in my third year at the University of Malta. I come from a very small family, very small common family, with no medical background whatsoever. Um, but I always wanted to study healthcare. Uh, and I chose midwifery because I think it is a very unique profession. We care for mothers and babies. And I think that the fact that you help a mother at such a vulnerable time in her life, I think it, it's, um, it's a very beautiful thing. It was around two and a half years ago. I still remember the date. I remember every single detail. The mother's name and the baby's name. It was a beautiful little girl. And it, for me, it was, it was a big thing. It was my first placement, my, the very first time I saw birth. And it was, it was amazing.
midwifery is not the same as it was before. There was a time where um, locals used to, used to know a midwife personally and that made a very huge difference in a mother's life. And also technology has taken over. Um, I'm all for technology. We're living in the 21st century and I think we should make use of technology. But I think we should um, create that balance between using technology and not forgetting our roots, um, which is um, carrying out our midwifery skills using our hands. I think it is very important for midwives to keep up to date with evidence-based research. Uh, that and the pride in, in, in your abilities and uh, the confidence in your chosen profession I think is very, very important if midwifery is to stay relevant in the future. You can't create that, that barrier around midwifery. It's not just you as a midwife. So it's good that you can work with other professions. I think it's very, very important, not only in midwifery, but in all aspects of, of healthcare. There are a lot of options that I can um, go for after I, I finish my bachelor's degree. Um, I'd love to continue studying, uh, maybe follow a master's programme or a PhD programme um, and maybe go into lecturing or research and I think the pride in that would be to train students and pass on the same principles that um, I have or maybe possibly opening my own midwifery practice, maybe by myself, maybe in a collaboration with midwives. Um, there are a lot of options, but um, the key is not to give up. It's been three years since Lauren graduated from university. This week, my colleague Veronica Danna caught up with her to find out how she's been and to hear the challenges of being a midwife during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hi, Lauren. Well, maybe you can catch us up a bit on what has happened in the past three years. The last time we saw you, you were a student in your third year of your Bachelor in Midwifery. Okay, what has happened since then? A lot has happened in my personal life, but career-wise, um, okay, so I took some time off, which was healthy for me, and then I started off a rotation period. So I just was working in different maternity settings, which was very helpful to me as a midwife because you gain experience from a lot of different um, settings and you learn from different people. Um, so that really helped and now I'm almost ending that period now. So it, only in the last six months are left. So that's a big, another big challenge coming up now because now you have to, you know, assemble what you learned. You have to choose a place where you want to work like permanently for the near future. How has your work changed due to COVID-19? Um, it has changed because we had to we had to implement new policies and protocols to you know to to um, manage these patients. Um, I had to take care of COVID patients myself as well, and we had to. It, management was doing such a really good job in trying to you know keep us safe at the same time make sure that there is enough staff to take care of the COVID patients and to take care of, you know, non-COVID patients. And because, you know, if they're pregnant or they're, you know, or they had a baby, they need a midwife and midwives in number are less than nurses. What kind of support, how do you support one another in your midwifery team? Um, I don't know, the fact, when I, when I had to take care of, of a COVID patient, she, she called up to check on me and see how how I was doing and you know if I because it, it was kind of like I was one of the first midwives who had to take care of um, a mother who had given birth who resulted positive and then on the other hand I found a lot of support from other nurses who are not midwives um, who were kind of like making sure that I put on my um, my clothing, you know, in a correct manner and taking them off in, in, in a correct way. So I had a lot of, a lot of support. Like, you know, we looked out for each other a lot. I wish you the best of luck. Maybe the last thing I'd like to ask you is whether you have any advice, either for expecting mothers or for uh, new mothers or perhaps also for colleagues, midwife colleagues. Well, I can't to say that you know like to, to I can't I can't tell them to relax because it's it's such a stressful time for everyone um, but I think if they find the right guidance and if they have any doubts please still consult with your local midwife or 
doctor or someone that can guide you. And to midwives, I think around the world, everyone I think is doing great jobs. So keep doing that um, and try to find support from your peers. Don't be afraid to talk and don't be afraid to reach out because I found a lot of support from my, my peers, especially. And we did help each other and just, you know, try to find a way how to, how to decompress when you go home and try to um, find some time for yourself. Try not to watch a lot of news and <laughs> try not to, you know, just we deal with it much too much at work. So at home, just try to be yourself a bit more and not forget about your self care. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. It, it's nice to talk to you as always. And I hope that I'm from Italy, so I hope that in Italy there are midwives like you, and I know there are because I've spoken to them. We're oh, just admitted. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure every country has has a lot of great people to thank. Yeah. Environment and health are fully interlinked. Back in 2011, and again in 2013, Copenhagen suffered serious flooding, which made its citizens rethink how they interact with the environment, even in an urban setting. Jürgen Thompson, a native of Copenhagen, explained to us how local citizens and local government came together to collaborate and innovate to prevent future flooding. My name is Jørgen and I'm a graphic designer and a citizen of Copenhagen. As well, I'm a teacher for dyslectic people. We have to accept both governments and municipalities and citizens. We have to stay together now. We cannot deal with these great problems. So we have to work together. We got two floods one in 2011 and one in 2013. We don't really talk about it anymore because it was such a catastrophe. And suddenly just the sky fell down. In the end, when everything was over, we knew we had to do something completely different. And we had to do something new. We have to listen to young people, older people, people we don't think know anything about this. We have to involve all citizens because if this has to be successful, a lot of people have to be involved. I worked on a, on a project down in our own courtyard down here, green roofs. And I worked in a couple of projects where we were going to uh, remove asphalt and put in different kind of plants. I think people are healthier because of the green areas now. The community it's more resilient today than it was before, much more resilient. Not just because of what we've done, but also because we accept the problem and we are handling, we are setting up new ways of thinking. I remember the floods here and everybody in this area, this neighborhood remember the flood because this, the, this place was completely underwater. The streets over there were completely underwater. I think people feel safer in many ways because we can handle water. We got deep pools down here. So water from the roofs are running out here and staying here for hours, maybe 24 hours before it's led into the sewers and it can pass into the ocean. A place like this will of course change people's life because they are coming more out of the houses, out of the apartments. They'll meet down here and talk more down here. And we can already see cafes over there. But the whole construction, the whole idea will bring people to life and the square to life. There are so many flowers here, plants here, and there are so many insects. That's, I mean, this is, is in the middle of the city, but just look at that plant there. Look at all the bees over there. It's fantastic. Better help to all. Does 
decisive actions taken by the countries across the globe because of COVID-19 have resulted in some unexpected consequences on the environment. WHO's European Centre for Environment and Health works on the environmental issues and addresses these issues. Dr. Oliver Schmoll explains the importance of addressing environmental concerns during the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, COVID-19 has had a noticeable impact on our environment. We are seeing cleaner air, reduced carbon emissions and less noise in many places where we live. And as our UN Secretary General um, said, COVID-19 is presenting us with an opportunity actually to use the recovery to build back better, not only socially and economically, but also addressing urgent environmental and climate change concerns. On the other side of the coin, climate change is also affecting our health, certainly in the long term, but especially now, it puts an additional burden on healthcare systems at a time when they are already severely stretched. Um, we heard a bit about flooding, um, but this year heat waves are of particular concern due to the COVID-19 outbreak that many people and especially groups that are vulnerable to both heat and COVID-19 are basically when the health systems are stretched in that situation and that requires really our attention. The good news is that we can prevent most of these health impacts while also following the advice to protect yourself from COVID-19 and as WHO our top three key cool messages are firstly to keep out of the heat, secondly to keep your home cool and thirdly keep your body cool and hydrated and remember you can catch COVID-19 no matter how sunny or hot the weather is. In a nutshell by promoting environmental sustainability hand in hand with economic recovery, we can make large steps towards mitigating climate change, achieving the SDGs, which in turn over the long run will also protect our health and our health systems. Even if you're in lockdown because of COVID-19, exercise is very important, both for your physical and mental health. Dr. Joao Breda is the head of the WHO European Center for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases in Moscow. And here, he explains why. Staying physically active is very important for our mental and our physical well-being. It can help these days to counter the negative impact and effects of additional stress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. Even while we are spending a lot of time at home and maybe we have limited spaces, uh, we have some constraints, it is actually possible and even extremely important to stay physically active. There are some things that we can all do. They are simple, it's just a matter that we organize ourselves in this context. If you're working from home, like many of us are, I'm working from home as well, we should try to stand up, work while you're standing with your laptop or whatever you are doing. It's really critical that we spend at least some time standing up, standing up. If we can do that, it's really a good measure to take because that obviously avoids sitting and mobilizes other parts of our body, our muscles, and it really reduces what we like to call sedentary time. It's also very important potentially to try some online exercises. There's a lot of them, there are many, they are accessible online, they are free, and really we have many of really good quality developed by ministries of health and others in countries, but also some developed by the World Health Organization that you can actually use if you like. Are you ready for some exercise? Johanni Reyes is a fitness center manager here at UN City in Copenhagen. He and his sons Thomas and Matthias 
we'll lead you through a family exercise session. Stay tuned and walk the talk with your honey. Hello, hi, I hope you're having a good time and I hope you remain safe. We are here, part of the Good Health and Wellbeing Department, and I am Giovanni. I'm Tiz. And I'm Thomas. And together we are delighted to bring you a physical activity programs with the hope that you're going to incorporate it within your household for all parents, friends, family, all together, having a good time, exercising together, getting healthier, hopefully getting stronger in these challenging times. All right, so now we're going to start with a little bit of a warm up or a stretch, and then we'll continue with the exercises. So now, so we're in both, we're all going to place the hands on your knees, and then we're going to start rotating the knees in here with a nice inhale and exhale. This is going to allow us to release some of the tension from the knees, ankles, lower back and hips muscle. Two more, one, two, three, and now opposite rotation, and let's go. Deep inhale on exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Now we start from this here, we go for squat and arm lift. So one, so three, and one. Now, we have got to remind you, now be careful if you are working out and you're performing this movement in a contrained space or a small space or if you have any lamp or any object to make sure we remain safe. If you have any injuries or any physical limitation, please listen to the body and just do as much as you can. Two more guys, one more and now your arms stay up. Deep inhale on exhale, and then one, two, three, and we go down. And relax, let your arms drop. Deep inhale on exhale, and from this movement, now we start moving side to side, allowing now shoulders, hips, glutes, lower back muscles to stretch before we move on to the exercises. Two, one, and now slowly coming up. And relax. So now, to give you a little synthesis or a little organization of what the exercise, this exercise program will compose, we have the lower body exercises to strengthen your quadriceps, strengthen your hamstrings, glute, and lower back muscles. Then we're gonna move on and work on those abdominal exercises or core muscles. And then we're moving on to working and strengthening those upper body muscles. We will give you multiple options, right? So those advanced, you can do the advanced option. The intermediate can adjust to the intermediate options. And those beginners and those people with some limitations, then they can adjust to their third options. So now let's move on with their lower body exercises. We're gonna place our right leg forward, no right? And then we're gonna have a little space in between us so that way we can move. And place your hands around your hips. All right, and from here, your back legs will go to the floor. And one, and two. Keeping your body nice and straight. Deep inhale, long exhale, and lovely family workout. All right, trying to get healthier, trying to get a little bit more physically active. All right, within those challenging times in here together with Thomas and Matthias. We got five, we got four, we got three, we got two, we got one more and we step forward. And now we switch to the other side where we place our right legs back, left legs forward on three, one, two, three, and one, and two, and three, and four. So the format is 20 seconds working and then 10 seconds break. You can adjust it to your convenience. You can do 30 and 15 or so on and so forth. Or like these superheroes that I have here, Tomas and Matthias, they do a minute and then they rest for two seconds and then they go back at it. But I am not that superhero, so I do 30 and 15. You will pick your own. Two more. One more, and now step forward, 
Oh boy, here we go. Immunization is one of the most effective health tools we have. Vaccines protect children from many diseases that would otherwise be debilitating or deadly. Now, as scientists all over the world work to develop a safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19, we're reminded once again of how important and precious vaccines are. Back in 2018, we met Katrine, an expectant mother. She explained to us how her then unborn child could not get vaccinated against measles until the age of one. That's why it's so important that others in the community are vaccinated to protect those who don't yet have immunity. My name is uh, Katrin. I'm 33, my man is 40. Wir haben eine dreijährige Tochter und erwarten im September unsere zweite Tochter. Das ist die Emma. Ich mache mir große Sorgen, weil in den letzten Jahren hat es sehr viele Masernfälle gegeben. Um Emma mache ich mir keine Sorgen. Sie hat eine vollständige Masernimpfung erhalten und ist demnach ja geschützt. Ich mache mir mehr Sorgen darum, dass unser, unser Baby, wenn es dann auf der Welt ist, sich bei anderen Kindern an, anstecken kann mit den Masern, da viele nicht impfen. Es hat einen Todesfall in Berlin gegeben, da ist ein kleiner Junge an Masern verstorben. Da macht man, mache ich mir als Mutter natürlich meine, meine Gedanken. Mein ungeborenes Kind, sobald es auf der Welt ist, kann sich anstecken. Man darf ja erst ab einem Jahr impfen. Ich habe äh, sowohl Impfgegner als auch ja, Impfbefürworter im Freundeskreis. Ähm, ich bin, als ich mit meiner ersten Tochter schwanger war, gefragt worden, ob ich mein Kind impfen werde. Und für mich war diese Frage irgendwie... Das war für mich keine Frage. Mir war klar, ich impfe mein Kind. Für mich war eher die Frage, warum impfst du dein Kind nicht? ist für mich völlig äh, unverständlich. Auf der anderen Seite habe ich äh, eine Freundin, die äh, leider ihr Kind in der 25. Schwangerschaftswoche geboren hat. Also eine sehr starke Frühgeburt. Wäre die mit ungeimpften Kindern in Kontakt gekommen, das wäre für sie wirklich ja, im schlimmsten Fall mit Sicherheit tödlich verlaufen. In Deutschland ist es äh, es ist so, dass wenn äh, ich mein Kind im Kindergarten anmelde, dass ich äh, ganz zu Beginn äh, den, äh, das U-Heft, also das äh, gelbe Untersuchungsheft, vorzeigen muss. Und äh, dem bei liegt ja immer der Impfausweis. Wenn ich mich aus welchen Gründen auch immer dazu entschieden hätte, mein Kind nicht zu impfen, müsste ich einen Nachweis vorlegen, dass ein Gespräch mit dem Arzt stattgefunden hat, dass der Arzt mich ausreichend über Impfen und äh, die Konsequenzen des Nichtimpfens äh, informiert hat. Ich äh, bin immer ganz froh darum, wenn ich weiß, dass die Kinder, mit denen meine Tochter spielt oder später auch mit denen mein Baby in Kontakt kommt, bin ich schon ganz froh zu wissen, dass die geimpft sind. Was hast du gemeint? Wir hatten in Deutschland eigentlich eine ganz gute Immunisierung. Wenn man dann die Zahlen sieht, dass wir in manchen Teilen bei 80 Prozent sind, das schockiert mich schon. Aber es gibt viele Kinder, die können aus verschiedensten Gründen nicht geimpft werden oder sind nicht geimpft und die müssen auch geschützt werden. Und das geht nur durch, dadurch, dass alle am selben Strang ziehen. Ja, ich denke, es ist unglaublich wichtig, dass wir diese 95 Prozent Herdenimmunität in Deutschland schaffen oder dass, dass die da ist, weil ich nicht alleine in der Lage bin, mein Kind, wenn es auf der Welt ist, zu schützen. Da muss irgendwie das ganze System mithelfen. 
Ich kann das nicht alleine schaffen, mein Kind zu schützen. Es braucht dafür die ganze Gesellschaft. Eine bessere Gesundheit für alle. We asked teens across Europe to share their idea of what they think a healthy school is, what makes a healthy school. This is their lesson to all of us. Oh, it's filming. That there would be no world hunger and climate change would be taken more seriously. Protection of the environment. A world of friendly environment. A peaceful world where we respect each other and have compassion for others. My vision for a healthy world is a world where people and nations don't put their own interests first. A healthy world is a world without violence. And everyone should stick together. A healthy world is a world without any wars. And not make war. Honestly, I dream that my family always remains the same as it is now, and I wish uh, that all families to live in harmony. Uh, the, the habit and the interaction and relationship between human beings. Uh, with, uh, with respect for different beliefs and cultures. A healthy world means healthy people. People who care about their minds, their bodies and their meals. Where everyone in the world has good physical, environmental and well-being health. A healthy school, in my opinion, is a school where everybody's opinion is respected, definitely not demolished, where people can fe feel comfortable talking and discussing with not each other, but also with their teachers, because in the end, they are the ones that are going to help us build the people who we are. Um, my vision for a healthy school is uh, a place where you're not afraid of... Um... A healthy school is one that promotes a safe and a captivating environment for the students. Uh, where you're not afraid of be trying to achieve the best version of yourself. That everyone would be accepted for who they are. Without violence or inequality. And students and teachers would encourage each other and be more supportive. Where everyone in the school, teachers, principals, students and all the staff are aware of their health and how they can improve their health throughout the school day. I think that the health promoting school is something like our center, a cozy place where doctors gain and offer their services to young people, uh, free and confidential. It's a good way that if a school could have something like wellness center, which we had. Health promotions is an important thing, but only few can put their knowledge in this field into practice. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, our school does everything in order to strengthen people's mental and physical health. In my school, everyone is not accepted for who they are or the decisions that they make. Every term we do a well-being day and it just it helps our health and relaxes us from all the stress of studying and everything. We undergo medical examination twice an academic year at the beginning and end at the end. Mm, so far, I think my school did a good job last year. My current school is pretty good on that because Teachers and students feel comfortable discussing with each other and sharing each other's ideas, creating not only an environment of improvement for themselves, but also for the entire community. My school is very close to that vision. They have, uh, they can do some improvement in that area, but they're very close to my dream of a healthy school. <laughs> My school organizes some 
health promotion sessions, mainly about bullying, and improves the school spaces. Unfortunately, in our schools there aren't any health lessons, so I would like uh, them to be. Uh, we have very good canteen where uh, skilled, very skilled uh, cooks work. Uh, the food is always fresh, uh, balanced. Still, it has a lot of improvement to do, mainly um, about the invo involvement of students in some decisions and in having a wider range of health promotion actions. So that is the advice from young people about healthy schools and healthy in schools. But what are kids saying about COVID-19? This week we received a video from our colleagues in Kazakhstan. This is what their children had to say. Enjoy! <laughs> You have to cough uh, with this part of your arm so it doesn't spread much to the other person. <coughs> it is important to keep distance between people because if you don't, you're at greater risk of being infected. <laughs> Es ist sehr wichtig, dass man sich, ähm, dass man die Hausaufgaben macht, dass man Online-Schule macht. Ja, obwohl das ist manchmal sehr nervig, verstehe ich auch. Aber es ist schon wichtig, dass man dran bleibt und dass man mitmacht und dass man einfach, einfach da durchgeht. I help fight COVID because I clean my hands. Aren't they smart? Staying with the theme of children and health, my colleague David has spoken to Penelope. She's nine years old, she lives here in Copenhagen, and she has recently started her own YouTube channel called Penelope's Pots and Pans. David has talked to her about her love for cooking and how children can learn how to cook. My mom decided to make a YouTube fit channel for me since I've been asking for a very long time. But she said I needed a topic, so I decided to do a cooking channel because I love cooking with my mom all the time and it's super fun to do. And I watched other YouTube videos where there's even adults. There's just people who are trying to cook and they're just horrible. They're so bad. Since I'm living in the city and I don't have a lot of things to do all the time with the coronavirus and stuff, because I can't play with my friends and stuff, and we only have three hours of school here. Some places they don't have any. So if you have free time and you can just work on it and stuff, then it's very, I think you would grow to love it. Me and my friends love to cook together. If other kids or even adults want to start a YouTube channel uh, or want to make videos for YouTube, what would you advise them? I would advise them not to make trash. At least that's what my mom would advise them. I would advise them to make trash. Why? Because trash is what people watch these days. <laughs> <laughs> people are too hooked up in trash. So. I advise them to do something from your heart instead of your brain because things from your heart are always trash. You are never too young to learn healthy recipes. Do you have your pans and pots ready? Let's watch Penelope cook up a tasty and nutritious meal. Welcome to Penelope's Pots and Pans. Today we will be making gnocchis, but this is also a very important video because it is for the World Health Organization. Make sure you're staying safe and healthy. Now we will make ricotta cheese because that is one of the ingredients to gnocchi. And you can always just buy the ricotta cheese at the store, but this is Penelope's Possum Pan, so we have to show you how to make it. First thing we need to add is six cups of milk. the stove top turned to medium-high heat. Now 
I need to add two cups of heavy cream. When we add our heavy cream, we cannot stop mixing because we don't want the heavy cream or the milk to burn. When there's foam just right around the sides, it doesn't have to be foam everywhere. That's why we're going to add one teaspoon of salt. Now it is pretty much foaming and now that tells us that it's time to turn off the heat. And add in four to five tablespoons of lemon juice. If you just keep on mixing, you can start seeing the cheese form. Now that our cheese is cooked, I have the strainer and I have a bowl. And I'm gonna put the strainer inside of the bowl and put a thin, clean towel on top. Then I'm gonna take this and pour it on top of the towel. I filtered the cheese out and now I have to let it cool and we can stir on the gnocchi. Now that our cottage cheese is all cool, it's time to make our gnocchis. Now, the first thing we need to add is one full egg, and you also have to separate your eggs so you only get the yolks. So two yolks, one egg and two yolks into the bowl. Now we need to add one half of a cup of Parmesan cheese. We bought this at the store. We did not make it like the other one. Now we need to add one cup of flour. And now we need to also add our homemade ricotta cheese. One cup and one half a cup. And now we mix. We need to add in one teaspoon of salt. You can always add a little bit more flour if it is, well, a little too wet or a little sticky. I put some flour on the board and I'm just going to dip my hands in the flour just so that my hands aren't too sticky and I'm going to take a little bit of our dough, like maybe that much and it's quite sticky so I'm going to put it down on here I'm going to roll it out into kind of a long snakeish look. I've got it into this line. We're going to take a knife and we're going to cut some pieces. Not too big but not too small. Like about that size. I'll cut that one in half. Now that it's all cut, we'll go ahead and put it on the cookie sheet. Now we're going to make the rest of our gnocchis the same way. And after that, we'll make our pea and spinach sauce. Now I'm with my gnocchis, and I have a pot of boiling salted water. And the temperature is at high heat. And I have this ladle, and I'm going to put a bunch of my gnocchis in the ladle, then I'm going to slowly put it down into the water so that we can put a bunch in at once. Now when you're finished putting these in, make sure not to throw away the water. We need that. I'll finish up with these and then we'll make the sauce. See how they're all floating at the top? So we're going to take some tongs and we're going to take them and we're going to put them into a bowl. Or you could also let them sit in there a little more if you want them a little more cooked. Now it's time to make the sauce. Now the first thing we need to do is add one cup to two cups of the liquid we just used to cook the gnocchis. Next, we need to add zest from one lemon. lemon. Then, we need to add one garlic clove and some pepper flakes, one half teaspoon of pepper flakes. Now we're going to add our spinach, make sure it's clean, and we need to add three big grown-up handfuls of spinach. That's a lot. 
spinach. Let's move this a little faster. We add one more cup of our cooking water, one cup and one half a cup of our peas, juice from one lemon, six tablespoons of butter, and salt and pepper. Now, after we do that, we need to add our gnocchis in. We have put our gnocchis in, and now it is all ready, and this is time to taste. Now it is time to try our gnocchis, but I'm not going to eat it alone. I'm going to call my sister, Margo, get over here. I'm here. Okay. Penelope, that's fantastic, and I'm so hungry right now. Hi, that's Gabby's with a mask. Hello. Understandably, these past months of restrictive measures and lockdowns have led to stress and anxiety. That's normal. Our social networks have been disrupted and many have seen their jobs and financial security at risk. In these times, uncertainty, fear and separation can be a part of our daily lives. WHO Europe has just produced a video on the importance of breaking the cycle of violence. With action, we can prevent violence from destroying lives. What is violence? Violence is the intentional use of force or power against a person, group or community. It can affect anyone, whether you're male or female, young or old, rich or poor, single or partnered. It can be physical, sexual or psychological. Neglect of a child, an older or vulnerable person is also a form of violence. Violence is widespread. In the WHO European region, within a year, one in every three children will experience some form of violence. One in three women are subjected to physical or sexual violence, or both, from an intimate partner at some point in their life. More than 80 people are murdered every day. Violence can be devastating. It can result in physical injuries and mental health problems. <laughs> Survivors of violence are more likely to smoke, drink alcohol excessively and abuse drugs. They are also at a higher risk of sexually transmitted infections, adolescent or unintended pregnancy. Some violence and the consequences of it are visible. Much more is hidden. Most survivors never tell anyone about the violence they experience, and even fewer get the physical and psychological care they need. No one thing causes violence. Factors that can make a person more or less likely to commit or experience violence include their history, their relationships, their community, their culture, their economic and socio-cultural situations. Violent behavior is also learned. 
Survivors are more likely to behave violently to others or experience other forms of violence themselves. For example, children who experience or witness violence are more likely to commit or experience violence in the future. But violence is not just an individual behavior, it's a societal problem. It's more common in communities in poverty and societies that accept violence as a way to resolve conflict, where men dominate over women and where parents' rights are valued over the well-being of children. We can break the cycles and stop violence. When people affected by violence are identified and supported, when we foster safe and nurturing relationships between parents and children, elders and caregivers, when we equip young people with the skills to succeed in life, when we restrict access to weapons and alcohol, when power is not used to threaten others, when we change harmful social and gender attitudes, and when all people are equal and we uphold human rights, violence is preventable, not inevitable. Building a better future for all is possible. The Sustainable Development Goals are the blueprint for a better and more equitable future. They address global challenges we face, including those related to poverty, inequality, climate change, education, peace, justice, and health. The SDGs are interconnected and they leave no one behind. <laughs> this looks like a child who's eager to go outside. This looks like a child playing hide and seek. This looks like a child who wants to save her teddy bear's life. Except it's not. By 2030, these children will be teenagers. Their health will be influenced by so many factors. They deserve to live in a healthier world where air pollution, child abuse and deadly diseases are bad dreams, not daily realities. Help build a better future for all of us. Tobacco kills more than 8 million people globally every year. COVID-19 is an infectious disease that primarily attacks the lungs. Smokers are more likely to develop a severe disease with COVID-19 compared to non-smokers. If you smoke, or if you know someone who does, now is a great time to choose health, not tobacco. Мен там экине биринчи чеккенбиз бул мектептен чеккенбиз. 600 кишинекеге келсе кызык болгон. 8-9 класс, 12 жашта, 13 жашта баштагам. Чеги. Кызык көрүнгөн. Кишинекебиз, түшүнбөйбүз. Мен там экине баштагам. Көп жылдан бери көп жылдан бери чегип жүрөбүз. Башташ оңой эмес экен да. Ошончо. Мен атым Эмили Баков. Мен 57 жашымдамын. 25 25 жашымдан баштап туруп, тамекин чегип көрдүм. Бирок деген көптөрө чеккен жокмун. 
4 yıl oldu bir yaka toğa gelgenime. Anan den sol çıkayın deyip duran o şu tam ekini taştakam takılın. A patient's perspective is crucial for good health care. When health services are people-centered, it means that people are not only beneficiaries of trusted health systems, but also participants. We have spoken to four people across the region on how they benefited from people-centered health care and what it meant to them. Here's what they had to say. People-centered health systems should be about listening to people patients and the caregivers about what they want to receive in the health system. Nikolai Ureman, director of the hospital, and the doctor of the hospital. I was able to get the hospital. I was able to get the hospital. I was able to get the I slipped and fell in my garden on the wet grass. They were all so nice to me, called me by my name, Olive, and I was able to communicate with them so much better. It made me feel that I was a person a person to them, not just a patient, I was a person. I had places where nothing was done, I felt nervous, I felt isolation, even from close to my isolation in the society. The daily center is not for you, but it gives you the opportunity to contact and it's certainly a place where you can share with the doctor, to see you, to talk with your brother and sister. It gives me a feeling of significance, it gives me the opportunity to share with the people to social media. It is very important to include the patients in the working groups that are being established and to involve the patients in representation of the permanent committees, whatever committees exist. It's very important. They know what is working and what is not in the system and they can advise of how to fix those, uh, those aspects and those elements that can be improved. These are the stories of four people from the WHO European region. Despite fundamental differences in the way their national health systems fund, manage, and deliver health services, these stories show that people-centered health systems are possible, even in a challenging environment. You can watch Journeys to Health in its entirety on WHO Europe's YouTube channel. As many countries continue with different forms of lockdown, maintaining good mental health is really crucial, especially during the periods of stress and uncertainty. Dr. Snezhana Zamaliyeva, founder and CEO of the Center for Mindfulness in St. Petersburg, Russia. They work with global Russian-speaking community but also with our very own colleagues in Moscow who during the lockdown participate in weekly mindfulness sessions. Uh, you know, when I read this first question, what is mindfulness? And that was like, what is mindfulness? Because you have so many different definitions. And, you know, I was thinking what is the best way and the short, shortest way to explain 
basically mindfulness is awareness and ability to pay attention it's ability to manage our mind moment by moment of course and to be fully focused uh, on the task at hand instead of you know disappearing or getting caught up with distractions and uh, the wandering mind is unhappy mind so and you know basically mindfulness is helping us to cultivate a clear focused and calm mind and that's all of us we really need it at, at work at home and especially nowadays in this uh, situ uh, new reality uh, uncertainty we are facing and we are facing an incredible information overload and so many distractions i would say constant distractions right lots of pressure and this being always on 24 7. so and that's what we really really need we need a tool which helps us be more to have our mind calm focused and in that respect be less stressed have less anxiety and be more resilient so and that's what mindfulness is before we come to the end of our hour with you take a few minutes to relax and immerse yourself in the meditation session led by dr snijana zabaliva Welcome to a short mindfulness practice. Start by sitting comfortably, your feet on the ground, straight back, relaxed neck, shoulders and arms. Close your eyes or keep them slightly open. And breathe the way it's comfortable for you. And now allow your awareness to rest on your body. Simply become aware about sensations throughout your body. And then use your out breath to relax and release any tightness, any tension in your body. And at certain point the mind would be wandering, which is okay, that's what the mind does. Simply notice the distraction and let it go and bring your attention gently back to your body. Allowing yourself to relax more deeply with each out breath. And now bringing your awareness to your face. And also using the out breath, relaxing the face muscles. Soften and relax all the muscles in your face. And in this way, allow your body and your face to be completely relaxed, completely at ease. And again, if the mind is wandering, just notice the distraction and release the distraction. And gently bring your attention back to your body. Softening and relaxing 
any tightness, any tension. And now gently bringing your attention to your breath, to the rhythm of your breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Just observing the rhythm of the breath. And again and again, bringing the attention back to the breathing. And at some point, using the out again to relax and release the tension in your body. And then continue to bring attention to your breath, breathing in and breathing out. Just observing the rhythm of the breath. without changing, without adjusting, just observing. And again, if the mind is wandering, just notice the distraction, release the distraction, and gently, this curiosity bringing the attention back to the breathing. Breathing in, and breathing out. And now we change the attention again. We will observe the sensations while breathing in. Which is, what are the sensations? And then breathing out, bringing your attention to the body and the face and relaxing the body and the face. And again, breathing in, observing the sensations of in-breath, Breathing out, releasing the tension and tightness in the face and in the body. And now, as our practice is coming to the end, just gently open your eyes and bring your attention back to the room. And ask yourself a question, what is important for me right now? What will be important? What is needed? Maybe a glass of water, a little stretching or something else. Let the next action be full of awareness, a mindful action. Thank you so much for the practice and may you all be safe, healthy and happy. Thank you. Physical distancing doesn't mean social isolation. So make sure you stay in touch with your family and friends. And from the WHO family here in the European region, this is our message to you. Hi, my name is Thank you for Salut din România. Rămânem conectați. Optimiști și sănătoși. Wishing you health, peace and prosperity. Hello from Albania. Given the circumstances, you need to stay home, stay connected, stay healthy. And wash your hands. Stay connected, stay positive, stay healthy. 
Hello from Romania. Stay safe, be healthy, and we'll win together. Dear world, I am Andrea. I'm from Romania. I wish you good health to train as much as you can to remain optimist and to remain active. Let's walk the talk together. Good health. Sanatat. Я Кирилла Ваяна. Самое главное берегите себя и своих близких. Salutare de Moldova. Pe timp de pandemie, fiți mai buni și sănătoși. Hi, my name is Bella. I want to thank you for all your hard work. Salutare de Moldova. Sunt Cornelia. Pe timp de pandemie vă îndemn pe toți să păstrați sănătatea. Aveți grijă unul de altul și fiți pozitivi. Salamat sănătate. Mina Tumgalia. Barnar Iugelungar Menem Amanisim de Zultov. Salamat sănătate. Mina Tumgalmas. Râs saldă în tămac. Hello from Romania. I am Anna. Stay connected, stay positive, stay healthy. We have seen encouraging messages from WHO staff across the European region. In essence, we must give up the idea that the sea will ever rest. We must learn to sail in high winds. Stay connected. Stay positive. Stay healthy. Olga, in spite of the distance between us, it has been wonderful hosting this Walk the Talk hour with you. Stay well, stay healthy and stay connected. Thank you Petra and also Rami and stay positive. Thank you Olga and thank you Petra. And to everyone watching, stay healthy.